Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our psychopharmacology consultation line today with Dr. Roscoe Brady and Dr. Macheri Keshavan. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the MHTTC website. And the PowerPoint slides and any additional resources discussed today will be available later today as well. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, you can use the chat and questions box down on the bottom left. Our MHTTC's mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across New England. Our area of focus is geared towards recovery through recovery-oriented practices and support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. And with that, it is my pleasure to announce Dr. Brady and Dr. Keshavan. So um, first I'll say uh, hello and thank you all for joining us for this webinar. And uh, thank you, Roscoe, for the introduction. Um, as she said, I'm Roscoe Brady. I'm joined here by Dr. Macheri Keshavan. We are both uh, physicians who are basically going to focus today talking a little bit about bipolar disorder with a specific focus on the pharmacology of treatment of bipolar disorder. My outline for how I'm going to spend this time today is as follows. For the first 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about bipolar disorder as a disease and its effects over the life course of someone with bipolar disorder. My rationale for doing that is simply that that actually has changed how I think about prescribing in the disorder. So, so my, uh, my experience with treating this is a little bit different than what I was taught initially in training. I want to try to convey them some of those points because it does make a difference, I believe, in terms of picking out medications, how you use them, and what you expect from them in treating this disorder. So we'll talk a little bit about that, about bipolar disorder as a disease. Then I'm going to switch to talking about specific medication um, interventions for bipolar disorder. The format of this is I'm going to speak, I'm going to try to speak briefly in the presentation so we have as much time as possible for questions, for any, any questions that come up over the course of my presentation. The slides themselves are more extensive or more comprehensive than what I'm actually going to say. The point being that these slides, so after this meeting, I'm hoping these slides will be a reference for people so that if you heard something interesting in this presentation, if you want to look at the primary literature, look up some of the papers, some of the actual trials that I talk about, it's all going to be there in the PowerPoint so that you can find them. Um, but for today's actual speaking presentation, I will probably go through the slides somewhat quickly and we'll jump past a few of the more detail-oriented slides to get to kind of summary slides so we can then move on to questions. I have a handful of questions already in front of me that people have submitted in advance and I'll try to get to a couple of those and also we're open to questions as they come up over the course of the webinar. So in brief, I don't have any uh, reported, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. I don't have any relationship with pharmaceutical companies or anything else that is relevant to this presentation. My salary support comes from Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital and also the National Institutes of Health. Here's how I'm going to organize the talk. I've mostly covered this, but basically just to talk about the life course of bipolar disorder, what treatment looks like at different times of uh, the life of someone who has diagnosis, and then get into the pharmacologic interventions themselves. How big of a problem is bipolar disorder? So I think you know everyone tuning into this webinar obviously like, is interested in this. You know I think from a treatment perspective, and I think most of us are seeing participants or patients with bipolar disorder in our clinic. What I want to acknowledge with this slide is just uh, what many clinicians already know. There are an enormous number of people, right, who have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, uh, say type one, that is people who have a history of manic episodes. There's also a similar number of people in the world who basically have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder type 2, i.e. people who have like cycles of being hypomanic and depressed. It's just worth acknowledging that you can put those two groups of people together and they're actually outnumbered by an entirely separate group of people who have a lot of features of bipolar disorder and it's simply unclear if they actually meet full criteria for bipolar disorder. And so what we're talking about, people who describe manic symptoms but never anything that quite adds up into a full manic episode in terms of the number of symptoms, duration, it's unclear, 
right? Like, what is the best intervention from a pharmacologic standpoint for people who seem to have something on the bipolar spectrum that's not clearly bipolar disorder type 1 or type 2? And in truth, like my experience in clinic matches the numbers in this slide, that is for every person I've met who very clearly has had a manic episode, who's been hospitalized, I would say I probably meet at least one or two people who have some symptoms, but it's not clear exactly is it bipolar disorder or is it something else? Is it an agitated depression? Is it the effects of substance abuse? And it's just worth acknowledging that up front, that a lot of the people we meet in practice won't neatly fall into some of the categories we're talking about. When we think about the life course of bipolar disorder, it's worth noting that in general, it, development seems normal, right? People who are going to go on to develop bipolar disorder, they hit developmental milestones, like their IQ, their achievement academically, really seems to be on track broadly. So there aren't like very glaring cues as far as like those, uh, those metrics, which is different from the schizophrenia. It's later on though, right? Basically, I would say in the late teens, the 20s, where people start to really show their symptoms. And this is maybe a key point to make in thinking about bipolar disorder. The average age of onset of symptoms, so not diagnosis, but the first time people become uh, notably symptomatic, is probably pretty early, around 17 or 18. Usually, usually the presentation is either depressive symptoms or depressive symptoms with some mild or undiagnosed manic symptoms, maybe manic symptoms that never reach kind of a threshold for treatment, but they're there. And maybe the, the kind of chilling point is these symptoms continue for the average person 10 years before bipolar disorder is finally diagnosed. Why so long? Why do people spend 10 years with these symptoms before getting a diagnosis? I think part of it is because their symptoms are not severe enough to be obviously bipolar disorder, but also because people accumulate other diagnoses, like the other diagnoses seem to explain what's going on, and frankly, there's a lot of comorbidity. And so substance abuse uh, diagnoses, anxiety disorders, these things all travel with bipolar disorder, and they make correctly diagnosing the problem early a real challenge, right? And to speak to those numbers, right, you know, when you think about it over a lifetime, the average person with bipolar disorder, you know, more than half of them has been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, a substantial portion has met criteria for a substance use disorder. These things are all moving with the diagnosis in a way that is always going to confound diagnosis and also get in the way of treatment. So what is the life course of having this? If we jump forward, to say, to age 30, for someone who has just been diagnosed with, uh, with bipolar disorder, they've had a manic episode, what does life look like after that? You know, it's very interesting. So the uh, life after that initial diagnosis can be divided up, like, you know, or you can think of it in different ways. You know, does the person meet, like, criteria for a DSM, uh, like defined mood episode? That would be, say, syndromal recovery would be the term people would use in the literature. But I think more important to clinicians, do the, you know, how long does it take to get to symptomatic recovery? How long does it take for people to get to the point where they're well? Like they don't describe any significant mood symptoms at all. Basically, what I think of as the treatment goal for clinicians. And the last question is functional recovery. When do people get back to actual the fun functional status they had before they were diagnosed? By which I mean employment, uh, living independently, being in control of their own income. These are very, very different things. If I could make kind of a summative statement, you know, fully a third of people who have a manic episode, you look at the two years after hospitalization, they've been symptomatic of mood symptoms the entire time. Like they say, there's no period where they aren't like this be uh, experiencing significant mood symptoms. And that, to me, it's kind of fascinating because when I was in training, I was this illness was described to me as kind of a cyclical thing that sometimes you're sick, then you're well, then you're sick, then you're well. But for, the, for many people with this disorder, it doesn't look all that cyclical. Maybe it presents in different ways at different times, but it really does look like a chronic illness, right, that can really be kind of very persistent in every day of a person's life. And maybe the thing I kind of uh, most notable to me, when you look at functional recovery, so not thinking about symptoms, not thinking about diagnosis of a mood episode, but how quickly do people get back to living and working the way they before, 
you know, honestly, like a minority, right, ever get back, have been those two years after that diagnosis, get back to where they were before the diagnosis. And that's striking because that really starts to look, again, more like a chronic illness, more like something like schizophrenia where it's just persistent disability or persistent like kind of lowering of functional status. And, and as I said, that has changed the way I look at this illness and like thought about like the need for medication and generally kind of thought about, yes, this is probably a chronic illness that probably needs active treatment every single day, not just when things start to look bad from a mood perspective. What does treatment look like 10 years into the fact? So that was looking at people who are new to the diagnosis and the first two years after the diagnosis. And you can think of that as a group of people who are new to this illness. Maybe they don't have a full kind of insight into the nature of it, how, you know, the need for treatment. What about 10 years in? So people who, you know, it is not their first time at the rodeo. They've been treated for some time. What does the course of illness look like even then? So in a group of people who are 40 with bipolar disorder, you know, the take home is that basically it still looks like a really chronic illness, even in people who have the benefit of insight, people who really I think are motivated towards treatment. In this group of people, they mean like the longest time people on average were in remission, like what we as clinicians would think of as like the treatment goal, the longest amount of time the average person could put together in remission is three months like despite being in this kind of like really organized treatment setting, despite being motivated, despite insight into like the illness, three months. So again, it really looks like a chronic illness. There is not good evidence that this illness burns out over time. I think there's evidence that people get better at recognizing the symptoms of an impending mood episode. People get better about learning their own illness and the best ways to basically avoid worsening, the best ways to kind of help themselves, to access help. All those things get better with experience. But the actual illness itself really seems to basically just be something that people live with. And the evidence we have is that just continues for the rest of one's life in people with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder type 1. That would be the average experience. So again, this is my summative statement. People talk about this as an episodic illness. I think it's phasic, you know, presenting in different ways at different times is better. But really it's something that for most people with this illness, it's really a part of their life. And that has as I said, changed how I think about these medications and how I think about intervention. So again, for the second half of my, you know, my kind of prepared statements here before we get to the questions and so on, I want to focus on specific pharmacology, like the kind of interventions that we do. What you're going to see in these slides, I want to make a caveat up front. This is very much oriented towards published clinical trials, towards evidence-based practice. And none of this is meant to replace what, you know, I've heard people refer to as practice-based evidence. What I mean by that is this. I'm going to present trial data where you look at aggregates, like cohorts of people with bipolar disorder who basically, yes, have the diagnosis in common, but absolutely are a heterogeneous bunch in terms of all the other things in their life as far as comorbidity, as far as resources, and so on. My point being that these trials tell you something about the average experience of someone with bipolar disorder in response to that medication. Whether or not that applies to the patient in front of you, you know, it's really, it's going to be very unclear. And experienced clinicians know that, like, these, uh, these trials, they are informative, they are helpful, but they don't necessarily tell you all that much about what to expect for the person in front of you. So I'm going to focus on the evidence, right, that's published out there. And my goal here is to kind of bring everyone up to date so people who don't have, like, the time, you know, that I'm allowed to, like, kind of look into the literature, to look at these reviews, try and bring everyone on the same page as a way of, you know, uh, informing what we do. But again, it's just worth noting, right, that, like, it's kind of the, the cases that we worry about the most, the questions I get in consultation the most are not about the average patient. They're about a patient who hasn't responded well to some of these indications or some of these medications. So we'll probably focus, and my guess is our questions will focus a lot on that, on the exceptions. So in brief, walking through specific, you know, specific medications, I'm going to focus on the summary slides where I try to basically pull together the literature. In these slides, you have a lot of specific slides that can lead you through trial after trial. But in brief, I'm going to say this. Lithium, right? I think the evidence is there that for basically the average person with bipolar disorder, it does have a role in preventing mania. 
it has a role in preventing episodes of depression. And that's, you know, a little bit less data for that, but basically the evidence is there that it can really help prevent these things. That said, when it comes to treating an acute, you know, episode, that is say treating someone who is manic right now or is depressed right now, the evidence gets, you know, it's a little bit different. So lithium, I think, has a great evidence base that it is useful in treating mania, right? And that's, I think, well understood and well accepted. It does have some evidence, right, for use as an antidepressant in bipolar depression. In general, basically the average experience of lithium, it is not nearly as effective at treating that phase of illness as it is at treating a manic episode. So someone with a manic episode, we expect, you know, lithium treatment, you know, we can get someone to a point of like, you know, out of the hospital in the span of a couple weeks. But someone who's depressed, I don't expect a lithium treatment for two weeks to get someone basically to remission from depression. And we just have to kind of understand that. One last thing to say about lithium somewhat broadly, right, is there is an idea that it has a specific effect against suicidality. So something that might be independent of its effects of treating depression, it may cut down on the amount of suicidal thinking, the amount of suicidal attempts, and actually the amount of, you know, successful suicide in people treated with lithium as compared to not treated with lithium. That information, I, I believe in that at this point is what I would say. And for a long time I was skeptical about that specific effect, and now at this point I think that really might be the case. The difficulty is that hasn't changed how I practice all that much because lithium is so lethal in overdose someone who walks in and suicidality is a large part of their presentation, there's a real conflict in my mind that like I am interested in taking advantage of this effect of lithium and helping suicidality and also concerned about putting something, you know, something that's so potentially lethal and overdose into the hands of someone who's at risk for that kind of an outcome. But I just want to acknowledge that. Why is lithium less effective? So if you look in randomized clinical trials conducted in, say, 2011, lithium is actually not that effective at treating any of those outcomes compared to trials done back in the 80s. Why is that? In brief, I'd say this. I think there's evidence that, like, a lot of early trials of lithium, they select, right, for people who, um, they select for people who can really stick with lithium as far as put up with side effects, people who are really very adherent to the logistical challenges of coming in, getting your blood drawn, and so on, you know, the kind of monitoring required for this medication, and also people basically who are not, uh, don't have a long history of suicide attempts by overdose. In that subset of people with bipolar disorder, lithium actually has a pretty good track record. And, like, that's helpful because I use those same kind of thinking and trying to decide who I'm going to shoot with lithium. You know, someone who doesn't show up for appointments, doesn't show up for blood draws, doesn't tolerate, you know, side effects very well, I'm probably not going to gravitate towards lithium. I'll probably try something else, right? So all of these trials informative to me. It's just worth knowing, right, that basically the effectiveness, as you get more and more, like, in terms of taking all comers, not selecting for treatment adherence, not selecting for people who follow up on clinic, you start to see more and more like, you know, equivocal results and it seems less effective. Let me move on. Valproic acid, also called Depakote. So in randomized clinical trials, valproic acid is also a really potent agent at stopping a manic episode. I think it's completely comparable to lithium. I think in average clinical practice on an inpatient unit, people who come in in a manic episode will be treated with valproic acid or lithium relatively early. Strikingly, you know, in an outpatient setting, when you're looking at prophylaxis at preventing manic episodes, the evidence is much more equivocal. Like, it's not clear that manic episodes happen less often in the presence of alproic acid. It's just their severity is less. There is a mystery in the literature, right, to me, which is basically, is alproic acid an antidepressant agent? I would say this. There is a lot, uh, there are a large number of really small randomized trials that basically say that it is. That, in my mind, comes in a conflict with a lot of uh, experience in the clinic that it is actually not that effective. There's a broader point to be made about, like, the value of, you know, multiple small trials that is, like, that is not necessarily all that valuable in thinking about these medications. One last thing I want to say about valproic acid is 
it may have a particular role outside in bipolar disorder and outside of bipolar disorder in treating violence and aggression um, as a you know pro, as the as a function of a lot of different diagnoses. So we can talk about that, and in fact, they will come up a little bit when I adjust some of the questions. And last, kind of lamotrigine. Lamotrigine, I would say, probably its best role, best use case in my opinion, is preventing future episodes. We use this medication all the time, you know, in treating bipolar depression. Its actual, its tolerability, you know, is actually very good. People in general can stick with that medication. Its efficacy at treating an acute manic episode is really not very good, somewhat broadly. There is a point to come back to in here, uh, talking about basically the initial trials of this medication looking better than like the sum of the evidence. But really, that would be my take home point about lamotrigine monotherapy. Maybe more useful than talking about monotherapy is this. Maybe one of the best ways to use lamotrigine, also called lamictal, is basically in combination with med other medications. So there are a couple of trials out there looking at people who are taking lithium who are still depressed in spite of taking lithium and adding lamotrigine to that, or taking a group of people with bipolar disorder who are currently taking quetiapine, also called Seroquel, who are not responding to that drug and then adding lamotrigine to that drug in a combination treatment. Again, those trials have worked out in the sense that that does seem to be a helpful addition, like using those two things together. As monotherapy, though, you know, it's not, it, I would say this, it is sometimes helpful, but that would be kind of fortunate, kind of speaking broadly. Okay, maybe one last point to say about mood stabilizers before we get into talking about um, antipsychotic medication is this. A key point I don't see stressed often enough is how to discontinue mood stabilizers. Treatment of someone with bipolar disorder inevitably involves stopping these mood stabilizers because they're not effective because it causes side effects because of drug drug interactions. These, you know, there are a lot of reasons that will come up. The point I want to stress is this: there is now overwhelming evidence that if someone is on a mood stabilizer and they have bipolar disorder, the way to take them off the mood stabilizer is slowly. And what does slowly here mean? I mean. Do not taper these medications over a period of, say, a couple weeks, the way you might for say, an antidepressant or something like that. There are a lot of bad outcomes that show up as far as like people being more prone to relapse to mood episode when you do that. For really, for anything we've discussed in terms of lithium, valproic acid, lamictal, the thing to do is, is taper over at least a month. And there is evidence that the best outcomes are when these medications are tapered over a period of months. Obviously, that's the best case scenario to work with a patient who can slowly, slowly reduce their dose over that period of time and stick with it. My point here would be you really should try to push for that because outcomes are much better in that situation. Now, to talk about antipsychotic and bipolar disorder, I'm going to try to do this relatively quickly, but just jumping to coming to the summary slide and then answering some questions. And at that point, you, depending on the questions, maybe I'll come back and do this in more detail. Broadly speaking, Antipsychotics have a well-established role in treating mania. Almost every antipsychotic that is, I think actually every antipsychotic that we've studied in a trial is effective at treating mania. And I would say to a large extent, they're all pretty comparable, right? So basically for treating a manic patient, I would say you find an antipsychotic that they tolerate, maybe one they've responded to in the past, but basically use those things to pick an antipsychotic. But once you've done that, these things, they all seem to work right, like somewhat broadly, maybe some are better tolerable than others, but to the individual, but really they are going to help broadly. Once you move outside of mania, once you start talking about other phases of the illness, things get, I would say, very different and basically a lot more mixed, right? In treating bipolar depression, here are the things we have evidence for. I'm maybe going to, I'm going to jump ahead a few slides. So these slides, when you download this or take a look at it later, you can see all the references that go into the summative slides. Um, somewhat broad, I'm going to say broadly, jumping past the lanzapine, quetiapine, abilify, prazidone, lorazidone, to a final kind of uh, summative slide. The evidence is there that quetiapine, also called Seroquel, taken at a dose in the hundreds of milligrams, 
does seem to be an effective treatment for bipolar depression. And now there are multiple trials actually showing that at this point. This is, I guess, on the one hand, good news because we have something that we, looks like it works and works repeatedly. The downside is this. You probably cannot get away with using small doses. Like the kind of dosing that we would use to treat schizophrenia, say 600 milligrams, that is a dose that seems to work repeatedly in these trials. Going lower than that, you know, treating with 50 milligrams at night um, is unexplored territory and probably does not work. Olanzapine, also called Bedprexa, so that uh, by itself, that in combination of fluoxetine, there's evidence that those things are useful at treating depression. I will tell you this, though, if you look closely at the data, there is not a big effect on people's report of their mood. There is a lot of effects in terms of, say, treating uh, someone who's depressed, the anxiety that comes with that, the kind of decrease in appetite that comes with that, the insomnia that comes with depression, but actual effects on someone, you know, if you ask someone, are you depressed or not, you know, it's actually not all that effective intervention in truth, but it's basically there is trial basis suggesting that it works. And finally, lorazidone, also called Latuda, there's evidence that that medication works at treating bipolar depression, either by itself or in combination with the mood stabilizer. Maybe one last thing I would draw your attention to is what's not on this slide. So when I think about antipsychotics and bipolar depression, in my mind, I start to think about other medications, like, for example, aripiprazole, which is also called Abilify. Um, I've seen that used frequently in bipolar depression. And, you know, sadly, I think we gravitate towards that because it's actually, I'd say, easier for people to tolerate. In clinical trials, it has not been effective yet as far as treating bipolar depression. Um, to jump forward now, kind of my last kind of speaking points here is thinking about antipsychotics for prophylaxis, so pr for preventing the next manic episode, for preventing the next depressive episode. What we know is this, basically, quick time, and again, I will jump forward past a few different slides here that you can review on your own. You can get a detailed view of these things. Um, but if I were to make kind of a summative statement for these things, when you're talking about antipsychotics, right, for monotherapy, if you're looking at someone who was treated with an antipsychotic for manic episode, I'm going to say broadly, staying with that antipsychotic is helpful at preventing the next manic episode. That antipsychotic, in general, doesn't really seem to do much at preventing the next depressive episode. So there is a reason to stick with it, and there is efficacy at preventing manic episodes broadly for antipsychotics, but in general, antipsychotics don't seem to prevent depressive episodes in a significant way. Um, maybe the one kind of exception, like, you know, to that would be, you know, I would say, um, so quetiapine, right? Basically, quetiapine, which is Seroquel, Olanzapine, which is Zyprexa. People were able to get to remission, right, with one of those medications. Sticking with that medication is, does seem to be preventive against the next depressive episode. So, but from a randomized clinical trial basis, really those are the ones that we know seem to have some, you know, some ability to prevent those depressive episodes. Everything else, really there's not much evidence. Maybe the last thing to say here, you know, in combinations of medications, right? So for antipsychotics in general, as I said, using a combination of a mood stabilizer and antipsychotic is even more helpful at preventing like mania than like say just using one or the other. Um, when it comes to preventing depression, there is not much in the way of clinical trials out there. Probably the best thing to point to is people who can stick with a regimen of a mood stabilizer, by which I mean either lithium or valproic acid, and also a pretty significant dose of quetiapine, like 600 milligrams of quetiapine, that combination is more effective at preventing depression than, say, like, you know, the mood stabilizer alone. It's just worth acknowledging that that is a pretty hard, from a side effect perspective, that's a hard regimen to stick with, right? There are a lot of side effects, you know, but with a combination of lithium and an antipsychotic at that dose. Okay, so as I said, that's the end of my slides. Again, there are a lot of slides that we moved past that basically have a lot of specific information about the literature that I was using to uh, you know, on the basis of these kind of summative statements. 
right now, I'm going to switch tracks. I'm going to start looking at some of the questions that we got um, in anticipation of this, uh, of this conference. So I'm going to address a couple of those questions, and I will be looking for additional questions that come in you know, via either, either voice asking, people asking questions or typing the questions in. Here's what I have as far as questions we received in advance. So question number one, how can Seroquel play a role in managing bipolar disorder type 1 or type 2 or anxiety and depression? And like the first part of the question is, in these cases, what amounts is therapeutic? So I think to some extent I've addressed that question. Um, I would say this, if anything, of all the antipsychotics, we have the most randomized clinical trial basis for thinking quetiapine, you know, Seroquel, we have the most evidence for it being helpful at both treating mania and treating depression and preventing future uh, episodes of mania and depression. That, you know, that has to be acknowledged. But the thing you have to also acknowledge is the doses we're talking about are really significant, right, as far as the side effect burden. You know, again, we're talking about, you know, 600 milligrams really seems to be the best efficacious dose with some evidence for taking 300 or 400 milligrams, but there's less evidence for that dose. My point being it is a useful tool. There's evidence to back up its utility, and also you probably can't get away with using a smaller dose. The second part of that question, part B, is are there any long-term side effects? And the answer is yes, right? So the long-term effects of using quetiapine at a dose of 400 milligrams or 600 milligrams is, I would, in my mind, primarily you know, two things. One, you always want to be on the lookout for basically extra pyramidal symptoms, like basically you know the movement side effects that come with atypical antipsychotics. That's probably less prevalent with quetiapine than some others, but still, I would say continuous monitoring for that and also the metabolic effects, right? There is great evidence that this dose of quetiapine taken over long periods of time, it's going to have effects as far as weight gain, as far as insulin resistance, as far as a dyslipidemia, and you need to monitor for those things during treatment just as you would for someone with schizophrenia taking these dosage, or really anyone, okay? Um, I'm going to come back to a couple of these questions. Question number, uh, another question I have here is, are there any known interactions between mood stabilizers and antipsychotics that staff should be aware of? So the answer, is, the answer is yes. But when I think about interactions between mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, there is not a lot as far as, how do I put this, idiosyncratic, like basically, oh, this specific medication plus this one is always a bad combination. There are not a lot of side effects like that. When I think about the interaction of mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, and the, the potential interaction, mostly what I think about is basically side effect profiles and adding those two side effect profiles on top of each other. So someone who experiences sedation with lithium or sedation with alproic acid, you then do an intervention like adding quetiapine, you are going to add more and more sedation to that person. Or other things like adding anticholinergic effects of other antipsychotic medications. Um, my point being that that's the main interaction I worry about, right? There are small uh, other things you could be concerned, or not, I shouldn't say small. There are other effects for some mood stabilizers in terms of interfering with the metabolism uh, of antipsychotics. Somewhat broadly, that is not a big concern for lithium. It's actually not much of a concern for uh, lamotrigine. And I would even say valproic acid generally doesn't change blood levels of antipsychotics very much. The one exception to all that, right, there is a medication that I haven't talked about much today that people use as a mood stabilizer. So carbamazepine, which is also called Tegretol, it doesn't have great evidence for its use as a bipolar, as a mood stabilizer. You will still see people taking it for bipolar disorder because it's pretty tolerable. There is plenty of evidence that that medication basically lowers uh, the, the serum, you know, it induces a metabolism of lots of antipsychotics so that someone taking an antipsychotic, basically if they start on carbamazepine tegretol, their brain will see lower and lower and lower doses of antipsychotic and that's potentially problematic, right? Tegretol 
induces uh, the metabolism of a number of other drugs, right? So somewhat, including itself, so it makes it somewhat problematic to use. I try not to start people on that medication. That would be the main other drug-drug interaction that I worry about. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, Dr. Keshavan here. I think, uh, Osko, you already answered the question that I was going to raise about uh, enzyme induction between a drug like carbamazepine and uh, antipsychotics. But I, what I would also add is um, if the antipsychotic happens to be something like clozapine, which is also sometimes mm -hmm. used in people with bipolar disorder, um, using it, it, another drug like carbamazepine, which can also reduce white blood cell counts, could yeah. be a bit problematic. So I think one should watch out for a possible interaction between carbamazepine and clozapine. Mm -hmm. No, and I think I think that is that is an excellent point, and, and maybe just to, to kind of stress that, you know, a number of the things that kind of we think about as far as so basically the monitoring aspect of treatment with these things, right? So they need to get like a complete blood count over, you know, routinely for clozapine, and also routinely for things like valproic acid or carbamazepine, you know, those concerns, right? Like that's, it was it just. It's probably something you're already going to do when treating these medications and should be kind of doubly on your radar. Not in a way that to me means you can't use these medications as a combination, but yes, exactly. You need to be concerned about this and whatever your vigilance is for these drugs, for these kind of interactions or these idiosyncratic effects, whatever your vigilance is at the start, you should be even more so, right, for these combinations. Okay. Um, let me, the next question, you know, I, this is, is an interesting one, actually. If someone's bipolar disorder involves a lot of self-injurious behavior, right, so assuming psychosis is well controlled, they have an evidence-based dose of antipsychotic medication, what is the best case scenario in terms of medication for impulsivity? I, I love the question, and, like, you know, the take home for me is I actually, so I am not 100% sure. I can conjecture from the evidence, right? So here's my, here's my conjecture, here's my thought process. There is actually pretty good evidence, like from, for a lot of diagnoses, that valproic acid specifically, so Depakote, has a real role in cutting down basically uh, episodes of aggression or, you know, physical aggression or basically or threatening behavior somewhat broadly. Um, that is that its utility in that role has been shown, I believe, in bipolar disorder, but more so even in, say, schizophrenia, in uh, patients who have a traumatic brain injury, and, you know, interestingly enough, uh, patients basically with a so sociopathy, right? It's kind of surprising. Valproic acid really seems to cut down acts of violence in that diagnosis. And also, finally, in patients who have a dementing illness, valproic acid has been used to cut down on, like, you know, basically physical aggression. Those studies are not looking at self-injury per se, right? They're looking at violence broadly, and they are looking at people who get hurt in the process of committing violence. It's not self-injury per se. But if you ask me what would I go to, you know, I would probably use that evidence, right, that basically is cutting down on violent acts, things like that, it probably gravitates towards using valproic acid as a mood stabilizer in the hopes of basically addressing that kind of self or injury, you know, uh, violence, uh, injury, you know, broadly. That's what I would go to. As an aside, like there is, I think, there is some literature and looking at so a medication that's not a mood stabilizer, so naltrexone. Um, there's some a decent amount of literature looking at using naltrexone specifically at preventing self-injury. I would say most of the literature is in populations of people with cognitive disabilities, people on autism spectrum disorder diagnoses. Um, I have heard case reports of people using that medication, you know, in other diagnoses. The point I'm getting to is I am not sure if that's applicable, if it's useful in the scenario that you're describing. It doesn't have an FDA indication for that use, but I would say there's, you know, there's some evidence for that. There's some, you know, reasonable thinking around naltrexone may be preventing self-injury that people experience as gratifying. I'm not sure. I'm going to turn the question over to Dr. Keshe. So this is actually a question, um, Dr. Brady, you, Brady, you mentioned uh, 
that lithium might have an anti-suicide effect. Would that generalize to reduction of self-injurious behavior? Yeah, so, so to get to that specific question, I don't think I've seen that measured as an outcome in those studies. Like when I think of lithium and its effect, right, I almost universally, when I think about those outcomes, people talk about suicidal ideation, so thinking about suicide attempts. You know, they look at actual suicide attempts themselves, but if we're talking about so non-suicidal self-injury, um, I just don't know. Like I could see that, you know, potentially working. So the self-injury we're talking about here is self-injury towards like a suicidal aim, I would say yes. If it's self-injury that's not suicidal, if it's self-injury, you know, with some other aim, I'm not sure. You know, I, I might gravitate towards valproic acid. But again, I guess I would say this, one of those moods, so the question is someone who's been treated with antipsychotic, what would you do? I think the take home would be I would add one of those two mood stabilizers for sure. Next question, can more than two mood stabilizers be used in conjunction with one another to control the patient's symptoms or is it best to stick with one medication? So here's, here's what I would say. This is a real weakness, you know, in the, in the published literature, I would say. Um, I don't want to make too broad like a statement, but I think for most clinicians, when you think about pharmacologic treatment of bipolar disorder, I'm going to make a broad statement and say, you know, monotherapy is not the norm. You know, so for someone who has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder type 1, basically being on a single medication that gets them into remission and keeps them there, uh, I would say that is, a, that is a rarity and that would be a fortunate event. I think the average experience of bipolar disorder is polypharmacy, like multiple medications, like all working, you know, basically added together, hopefully in a thoughtful way to try to prevent future episodes, to treat current episodes. But I think polypharmacy, like, is almost the norm in actual clinical practice. And unfortunately, there is a real paucity of studies that look at combinations of therapy. Like, it is kind of a striking weakness, like, in the literature that we haven't been able to look at that more often. So well, here's what I would say. The trials that I can think of, you know, maybe, maybe really only two or three trials looking at combinations of mood stabilizers that I would consider large enough to really kind of get at these questions. The, there is a trial, so this is published in Lancet Psychiatry. The name of the trial is the BALANCE trial. It looked at a comparison of treating people with bipolar disorder with lithium alone versus a combination of lithium plus valproic acid. And the outcome they were looking at is preventing future mood episodes. The take home from that study was the combination was not superior to lithium. And the, like, the, really the fuller take home was they found that lithium basically worked just as well as lithium plus valproic acid. And valproic acid basically was less helpful at preventing future mood episodes than any combination of any lithium alone or in combination. So they did not find evidence for those two things working together. Um, the one other kind of best example I could think of in the published literature is uh, I think the LAM-LIT trial that I referenced in an earlier slide where combining lithium plus the motrogene together, that did have some efficacy in treating bipolar depression in combination uh, that you didn't see with, say, like uh, lithium alone. Outside of that, outside of that, there is not a lot of published literature. And basically what I would say is, you know, inevitably I think patients are going to end up, you know, taking combinations of medication. Probably your best guide to actually specific medications really is going to be based on the individual's experience, the patient in front of you. What have they responded to in the past? What have they tolerated? What have they been able to adhere to in the past? and looking at combinations in a thoughtful and I would say careful way, like slow titration when you're adding a medication, there's less to say from a randomized controlled trial basis about what's the best choice, though. Let me turn the question over to Dr. Keshe. Yeah, on that note, I just want to add that, um, uh, you know, this is sort of the point of view of general principles of psychopharmacology, not necessarily based on evidence, which is rather minimal in terms of polypharmacy. In general, uh, in psychopharmacology, there is good polypharmacy and bad polypharmacy. Yeah. The bad polypharmacy is trying to use two medications uh, of the same 
kind of pharmacological uh, class together is uh, generally not such a good idea. For example, if you were to combine uh, valproate along with chlorpromazine, I'm sorry, carbamazepine, that may not be as you know neat an idea as uh, say combining lithium and lamotrigine, as you just mentioned, because they do have different mechanisms of action, and it makes more it's a rational polypharmacy as opposed to a non-rational polypharmacy. So that's that would make sense. Yeah. 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 So. Let me uh, let me do this. Let me stop basically. So this is you know at this point I've gotten through a number of the questions. I want to just pause. So if anyone has a question that they want you know they've been thinking about, waiting for an opportunity to voice, I want to give people a chance for that or to type in a question. If there aren't questions, I can maybe go to a couple. I can try and find a couple other questions we've been we sent. Yeah, but I will give people. Give people a little bit of time here to type or to speak up. Maybe I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, what's your experience with um, skin rashes with uh, lamotrigine, and uh, oh. what would be your approach to? Kind of advising patients and uh, also handling problems of uh, the skin rashes. Yeah, I this, I love this question because I think lamotrigine, right, is how to put this. If you can find someone who responds to lamotrigine, it is a great thing because, somewhat broadly, it is such a tolerable medication. People are going to adhere to it with you know fewer side effects than other medications. And also, we see patients, you know, worried about the risk of Stephen Johnson syndrome, the idea of like a really a life-threatening rash. Rash. Here are the things I keep in mind, and here's what I tell patients as far as this medication. Right. So one, acknowledge what people are probably going to, you know, you should tell them about in the first place, and they can also find out if they go online. There is a risk of either benign, you know, rashes and also basically have like really scary kind of life-threatening rashes with lamotrigine. The way we titrate this medication, like the slow, you know, week-to-week-to-week -to -week -to -week progression reduce, of increasing the dose is done because using that kind of slow titration really, really minimizes the risk of having that kind of event. Here are the other things I tell patients before starting lamotrigine. I tell people the following. This medication does cause totally harmless rashes, you know, somewhat frequently. Maybe like you know, 20% of patients who start on lamotrigine are going to have a completely you know kind of trivial rash because of the medication. And so I tell people, for the next month as we start this medication, don't change your laundry detergent. Please don't go on hikes in the woods. Like you know, don't do anything that really like is going to set you up for a rash that's going to be confusing to us as far as trying to figure out is it drug induced, is it something concerning? Yeah, don't do anything. There are actually trials that have shown that if you give people that advice, you can cut the number of rashes in half by just by virtue of people avoiding things that cause rashes from day to day. The second thing is this, you know, is to tell people like, you know, if you develop a rash, right, I want you to contact me and we're going to talk about it and basically come up with a plan. For me, the ideal situation of how to manage a rash is this. Like, so if someone calls up and basically says, yeah, I started the medication now, a few days in, I have a rash, what I say is this, I want that person to be seen by someone who has an experience of looking at a lot of different rashes, you know, really can kind of differentiate, uh, say, drug-induced rashes from other kind of benign, like, you know, skin reactions. I'd like them to be seen by someone who, can t you know, who sees a lot of rashes in the next 24 hours. Like, so that could be an emergency room, but for me, I, more ideally, they go into urgent care, or something like that. And basically, someone can put eyes on that patient, or even, if possible, come into my own clinic, and we can see the rash for ourselves. I would say somewhat frequently, basically, urgent care is maybe one of the best kind of situations. Um, other things I think about are as follows. The real risk, like almost all the risk for someone having a toxic reaction, a serious rash, is really front-loaded for this medication. So it's the first three months of treatment with lamotrigine. 
so uh, that where like you see 90 percent of the cases that are going to progress you know to like something that is dangerous um, 90 percent happen in the first few months of treatment once people get through those first three months obviously you're always going to be vigilant for a rash but if someone's been on the medication for five years and they basically call up with a rash, right, and they're really worried, they're worried that this is going to basically put them in the ICU immediately, I would say two things. Two message delivers. One, yes, you do need that to get checked out, right? We have to take this seriously. And also, two, no, you don't need to panic, right, because this, the likelihood that this is going to progress to something more serious, it's re it really is quite low, but still, we're going to take it seriously. Maybe as a final point, you know, when uh, I used to ask questions about like, oh yeah, what is a, what is a serious, um, what does a serious rash look like? You know, basically, what is, you know, how do you tell the difference between a rash that's going to progress to something versus not progress to something? There is not a great single rule of thumb, like especially if you're not someone who's used to looking at a lot of different rashes. I might say this though, any rash that spreads say, above the shoulders, a rash that gets to the neck, gets to the face, like, I would consider all of those actually very concerning, right? You'd want that person to get checked out immediately. You know, the conventional teaching for Lamotrigine genes, oh yeah, if it's Stephen Johnson syndrome, you know, if it progresses to include the mucous membranes, you know, that's, that's dangerous. And I would say, yeah, that's obvious. That would be someone that, like, I, <laughs> I would call 911 immediately, but more broadly, a rash that spreads like above the chest, right? That is very concerning. That's something that should be accepted that's even higher on your list of concerns. And maybe the last point for lamotrigine is as follows. Warning people that if they miss doses of lamotrigine, they can't just restart the medication at their prior dose, right? So as a general rule of thumb, I've told people, if you miss a single day of lamotrigine, yes, you can take whatever dose you're prescribed as usual the next day, right? or if you miss two days, that is also probably a safe scenario. If you miss three days of emotion in a row, I want you to call me up. We're going to make sure that's exactly what you missed, and probably at that point we're going to cut the dose in half. We're going to stick at that, you know, half dose for the next week and then increase from there. If someone has missed four days in a row or more or five days, if someone's gone on vacation and they just forgot, didn't take it the whole week, we're going to restart at basically the starting dose, like so, you know, 12 and a half or 25, you know, 25 milligrams. Basically, we're going to start over. That person should not, say, pick up taking 200 milligrams like they were used to or something like that. Thank you. Right. Dr. Brady, do you want to get on to the two questions here, two and three? Yes. If there are any from the audience. Yes. Let me address, like, the last couple questions that were basically asked in advance. Um, and these have, I'm going to say, less to do with conventional psychopharmacology, but I, I love these questions because they really speak to, like, the experience of treating people with bipolar disorder. So question, um, yeah, question number two is, what are alternative ways to experience, like, the joys of mania without using psychiatric or street drugs? And the question number three, I'll, I'll kind of talk about these together. Question three is, why does mania provide such rich neurological connection and alignment with the experiences of mystics from the past? And are there ways besides, say, SSRIs to safely induce this? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to collapse with this question into kind of a summative statement, which is this. Individuals' experience of having this diagnosis is really variable, right? Like, I've spoken to people with bipolar disorder who are truly, I would say, traumatized by their experiences of mania, like and I, in a way that really kind of resembles PTSD. And I've spoken to people with bipolar disorder for whom being manic or being a little bit manic is not viewed as a bad thing, right? It's actually, in, to, for some patient people, not the general, but for some people, it's an experience to be sought out, right? Especially for people who haven't suffered a lot of consequences of prior manic episodes it is something that people will gravitate towards, and especially, and especially if they are living in basically a depressed state, and they basically want to get somewhere in the middle, want to get closer back to the hypomania. So here's what I'd say. I, for someone in that situation, my approach would be as follows. Acknowledge it, right? Because if that's where the person's mind is, you have to acknowledge that basically they're seeking out that kind of feeling for a reason, either because they remember it fondly or because their current reality is 
you know, really tough as far as depression and really kind of convey that you understand where they're coming from. The second part of the conversation, though, is this. I don't have any recommendations as far as like a safe pharmacologic way to kind of capture that kind of feeling. I, for an individual, I, I don't know that I can make a recommendation of something that really would capture that individual's like the benefit or their subjectively good experiences of mania. I'd be really worried about recommending something because I don't have a background in recommending, say, other things that are not kind of purely medicinal. What I would do is this, acknowledge the reality that for some people these experiences like are a mixed thing as opposed to a bad thing. The second part would be to take an approach that I would guess I would put under the heading of motivational interviewing. Acknowledge that there is something pleasurable about the sensation, but then really ask, you know, is the cost of seeking that, right? So basically the things that you do to kind of capture that feeling be it stopping medications, partial adherence to medications, or taking recreational drugs, or trying to take things that are you know, non-recreational drugs in pursuit of that feeling, is it worth it, all right? And this is an approach, so we use motivational interviewing for a lot of different things. I'm mostly I'm thinking of substance use disorders. I don't wanna make a direct comparison, but my point here would be to get the person you're sitting with to acknowledge the good, right, or acknowledge what they love about feeling manic, and also acknowledge the dangers of pursuing that, right, acknowledge, like, you know, what are the costs that you might pay, and basically weigh those two things side by side. And the goal here being trying to move someone to a point where, I put this, they're really trying to think of ways to basically feel fulfilled in life without specifically trying to capture a very specific sensation that comes with mania. Because that's somewhat broadly, I think of that as dangerous, right? Like it is very, 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 very hard for most people impossible to kind of really capture that exactly. I don't encourage it, right? That would be my stance. I don't know if you have anything. Well, you know, I think uh, I would totally agree with you. Um, but the important uh, thing to keep in mind is uh, in relation to this question, especially the second part of this question, as to why does mania provide such rich neurological connection to experiences of mystics from the past. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the majority of people who report mystic experiences do not have mania uh, or use drugs to induce such spiritual experiences. These are experiences um, some individuals um, report in the context of, um, you know, maybe sometimes uh, uh, being in a mixed nature or being in a mindful meditation or pursuing a spiritual cause and so forth. So one should consider non-pharmacological, non-substance-induced paths towards uh, such uh, um, experiences of um, richness, uh, ecstasy, or happiness, or mystical experiences, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think we are almost uh, at the end of our time. I don't know whether Vanessa or Rachel would have any housekeeping uh, points to say before we wrap up, or any other last-minute questions. Um, well, I just want to add thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, you'll be receiving an evaluation form for this webinar or consultation line right afterwards. And in addition, we have a few upcoming events. So please feel free to register if you're interested. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all from uh, myself and Dr. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. yeah, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. All right.